we have Justin Kendall here, an amazing sculptor artist based in Brooklyn. And I was actually on your website. And I thought this was perfect to kind of give my quick intro. This says on your website, centuries spanning sculptural history accumulating bush in a bushwick basement. Yeah. I was like, that's a pretty solid sentence to describe. But do you want to also introduce yourself and in quick synopsis? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a sculptor, uh, classically trained. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved to Brooklyn in 2018. Uh, right at the end of the year mm -hmm. after graduating from the Florence Academy of Art. And uh, I started out like most kids do, just like parents giving them like pencils, color pencils, yeah. things like that. Uh, but from a very early, from very early on, I was doing uh, more representational. Mm. Uh, not like in the sense of drawing cast, drawing people, but I right. really like to copy things. Yeah, I kind of lost a little bit of that like childlike imagination. Mm and was really obsessed with like, this is what I'm looking at. I want it to look like that. Mm -hmm. So I would draw um, sports logos. I was a ho into hockey back then. So I'd draw right. like, ho <laughs> I'd copy hockey cards, yeah, yeah. whatever. I used to be down about it, but then, uh, cause I was like, oh, there's like no imagination here. Right. But m my elementary school art teacher was like the greatest artist of all time, like copied reality yeah. in a way. Right. So you were a uh, naturalistic fanboy from a young age. I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I went, I did undergrad at VCU mm -hmm. in Richmond, Virginia. Um, it was real like contemporary kind of modern school mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just like four years of me failing basically to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, Cause like you, when you're trying to do something more traditional in a mm -hmm. setting like that, you always feel like you have to justify it. Totally. So it was like, instead of me just, just learning or teaching myself how to make a good portrait, make a good hand, whatever mm. it was, it was always trying to do that while juggling the weirdness that I thought I had to inject into and it. And those weird, you know, nebulous, um, conceptual ideals that uh, maybe those art schools, you know, try to force out of you, yeah, squeeze out of you. And you're like, sure. I'm just trying to do yeah. this the best I can copy it, this hand. I thought it could never just be like a clay thing. Yeah. I was like, I need to sculpt. I need to make this out of foam, mm. like pink and blue styrofoam. Uh. I need to make it weird. Mm. Um, so there was like a few nuggets of um, interesting things in that from that work, but it really wasn't mm. um, uh, what I wanted to do. So luckily I found Florence Academy of Art right. and moved there. Um, yeah. And that's where things blasted off. And I want to get into it because that's like the because okay let's 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 run it back real quick you went to this four-year school with the intention of sculpting or you're just doing sort of the general generic art class drawing no so uh i actually went to this school with the intention of becoming my middle school art teacher basically with the intention of becoming yeah okay so uh i just like loved that teacher and was oh, like nice. i want to teach shout out him um yeah steve harris shout, shout, out, steve. shout out steve harris wherever he is um <laughs> Cause he was all about skills mm -hmm. too, like, um, very heavy and like drawing and just getting things right, mm. um, for in middle school, which was really big. But, um, with the way that my undergrad worked, and I think a lot of schools do this the first year we can get into college art yeah, schools. Later, I do. I get it with like, a lot of people. It's uh, wonderful. I love the, all the opinions. Looking back, it's a bit of a scam. First year is like your, they call it art foundations mm -hmm. where there is no major yet yeah and then you apply to majors after that yeah. i have the same thing at parsons yeah. first year program yeah, it's just like a survey and okay but dip your toes into yeah some... so i originally started with art education major okay found out i loved working with my hands in 3d sculpture okay. added sculpture as a double major mm. then realized that i was going to really not like teaching in a public school wow so I dropped the art major i was like two classes away mm -hmm. from like getting the degree Interesting. much to my father's <laughs> worried and anxious about it um and then just finished with sculpture yeah and so this is you're like you didn't take any time off this is straight from high school into college normal undergrad and so you're like not even 22 yet you're like yeah okay yeah. and so then you decided that's pretty young to go to florence to so, this is there was between. a time between undergrad and florence okay um i didn't have the money to go mm -hmm. i got accepted in 2013 when i graduated I right. couldn't go then. So I worked for two years, Okay, saved up a little bit, and then started Florence in 2015. That's amazing. And that's still pretty young. I still like. pretty young. Yeah. Because like, again, that's and American like, especially too. Yeah. Like, it doesn't travel a lot. Well, that's my question is like, that's like a pretty, I was similar in my desires. Like I went to three universities. I kind of 
buckled around and deep down I kind of knew what I wanted and then I went to Parsons and it was not what I wanted and then I found the atelier world and I was like holy crap this is exactly what I want but I feel like not a lot of people have that especially at a young age but you knew you were like okay wow let me take this deep dive into sort of traditional yeah so I knew that what really sealed the deal was looking on their website mm. the website's much better now but back then it was like mm-hmm. just um basic like these are the the faculty mm-hmm. a little bit about the facilities and then the student and alumni work mm-hmm. and seeing that i was like i gotta get over there yeah if that's now part of me thought what if they're just showing like the best work yeah you know like people that were already good that yeah. just wanted model time but they're renowned were they not like renowned of then? course they were okay. and, it, and it like that was just like my like slight, okay. but it was clear yeah. within a, like the first day. That's like, oh, mm. like this is legit. This is yeah. real. Um, and also it's just hard to not improve if you are working from, the, from life six hours a day for yeah. 10 weeks at a time. I mean, know? it's like D1 art school, yeah, art training. Absolutely. That's what I kind yeah. of sh- to say to the layman. Yeah. Particularly for sculpture. Yeah. Uh, because there was actually a U.S. branch here, mm. and there's a bunch of other ateliers mm-hmm. on the East Coast and West Coast here, um, but none had a full-time dedicated sculpture. That's program. my other question. I think we were talking about last time, for people listening and watching, I, we went to his studio. Um, we're going to film a video, and I checked out, but we were talking, and that was one of my questions, because I feel like maybe in the United States also, not that I'm some expert on ateliers, but like painting is a little more accessible, you know, a bunch of painting programs, a bunch of painting schools. I'm sure there is sculpture, but it seems like to get to level that you were at, that you're at now to get that training, it seems less accessible. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's a couple of things. It's, um, perhaps the lack of people just able to do it, do the job well, like competent in, in knowing how to sculpt and then get those ideas across to students. Mm-hmm. Um, which is one of the great things and all credit to my mentor, Rob Bodum. Mm. He was the one that founded the sculpture program at Florence Academy. Wow. So what's great is as he graduates more and more students, particularly American students, they come back here Mm -hmm. and now it soon will be even more successful. There is already some alumni teaching, um, Alicia Ponzi out in California and things like that. But with the accessibility too, it's, uh, it's an infrastructure thing. You need more, way more space. That's what I was going to say. It's just a Um, physical. Yeah. Um, Cause you could bottleneck. I mean, you can do some things, um, you know, like art students league, um, they have sculpture there. Yeah. Um, but one of the ways they make it, uh, certainly affordable and accessible is that it's, you know, 20 people in a room with a model, uh, yeah. and which is less than ideal. So, mm. you know, for, for an atelier to really get, I think a good sculpture facility, you need a lot of space for, not a lot of people and people don't like that idea yeah i didn't even know that like i'm like just a greenhorn here so it's interesting because you could do that i I see no difference because i went to the students league yeah and there's 20 people crammed in for painting and sometimes you're in the back with not the best angle but it's it's almost the same as being up front but you're saying for sculpting you just need literal room yeah so you just need to dance particularly (laughs) with uh the way uh we're trained in florence the idea is almost everything about the sculpture is decided 10 feet away. Mm. Um, it's it's all about standing back uh, and looking at your sculpture and the model on equal terms or as equal as you can. Um, and yeah, the idea is that every, every piece of clay you put on that is an answer to a question that you've asked from observing mm. from a distance. Mm. Um, so you just need space just, for that. Just space, wow, that's fascinating, that makes sense. Um, and now, I mean, this is just, full circle i want to talk about the business because there's so many questions so like you have a business now oh yeah that's amazing thank you fountainhead gypsoteca fountainhead gypsoteca yes and it's so cool because it's literally again i i remember talking before i was like wow this is such a rational cool idea that i don't know why more people are doing and it's shocking that i'm sure there are like you said but you know making plaster replicas of super famous works for an extremely you know, accessible price for students, for art schools, for just collectors, people yeah. interested in art history. And so what was, you were maybe one of the seeds of your teacher that was like, all right, go back to the United States and well, so, you know, do your own thing. Yeah. Well, when I left, um, actually I came to New York, um, to work at a commercial sculpture studio, mm. shout out to studio ice. Um, and that, that was originally what I came here for. Um, 
But with COVID, once that went away, I had to find something else. And what was that? Sorry to... Oh, was yeah. that like a... That's you're a, a assistant, you're sculpting what? Generic so they, they mainly do kind of two types of figures, right? They'll do... Um, they have the bronze monuments, you know, founding fathers, historical figures. We did... A, actually, what was really cool, we did a 12-figure uh, uh, women's memorial for my hometown, mm. Richmond. Um, so there's, there's that side where it's like clay sculpture goes to bronze gets put outside and there's a, a core team yeah there's, executing there's that a lead sculptor thing. some assistants mm -hmm. um and then the other thing that they mainly do would be like there's more fabricated figures that go to museums mm -hmm. right it's like it's a combination of life cast that gets um sculpted into that then gets painted and mm -hmm. then we hire a team of um historical experts really that come in and dress the figures with like period clothing Whoa. and then they go in museums wow i was doing more of that um well, that's pretty cool so it was it was a lot of fun um learned a lot of like just like technical moves mm. um efficiency things cost cutting things like to, that are really practical for for any sculptor to know yeah um and correct me if i'm wrong but it's hard out here to make a living as an artist yeah yeah i mean that's <laughs> so this was a job this was it was a good... it was a it was a great job i was you know a little bit of debt from florence right <laughs> so um uh yeah and that that is uh the thing so many artists they leave undergrad and then their job if they're lucky is working for another artist right yeah if it's not like doing something else right so. or even like i would i know Florence is, you know, a program, but it's like an elite program. And if you leave that elite program, you're going to be an elite artist with all these wonderful skills. And it still sucks. And it's just the world to see those people still struggle to make money. Yeah. After dedicating three, four years and becoming, you know, really technically skilled to then not be able to make money. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm very happy with the business. Yes. That I started. <laughs> so let's uh, get into it. Yeah. I mean, it kind of. I guess technically started while I was in still Florence because before I left, I went into the cast room and just picked a few that nobody were using <laughs> um, and just made my own molds real quick in like a day or two. But just because you wanted for Just because I wanted for myself. Yeah. I was like, uh, I wanted these just to hang up in my room or my studio or whatever. Do you remember which ones they were? I got, um, it's a very famous female hand. Okay. It's a, I think it was originally from life. Um, it's just a female hand. Okay. Um, I got uh, the drowned girl. Um, that's what I call it. There's this really long French name, mm. and I I really can't pronounce French words, so I'm not gonna. I try. know little to zero. But everybody, everybody yeah. almost everybody like that moves in the atelier world will know this cast. It's mm. um, and it's actually I don't know if it still is now, but it was the face of the CPR dummy. Um, it's a cool story. It's, wow. The the story goes there was this young French girl, I was get, guess having a rough time of it, and she threw herself into the Seine River in France, drowned herself, and when she washed up, the people that found her, the court, they thought her face was so serene, this is the story, so serene, so beautiful, there's like this weird, like kind of enigmatic, like Mona Lisa sort of smile okay. on her face, but somebody, they made like some sort of wax mold of her face, and then that cast got yeah. you know push through history the other story is that it's just a german doll maker's daughter I like i've the heard first, the first one i like the first one better. yeah so and was, I, I think i know which one yeah is on because you still replicate them yeah, right? yeah or it's yeah. on the home it's page a staple. Yeah. yeah okay uh everybody loves that one it's a great story uh, so the hand her and then a mask of christ from michelangelo's pieta mm. um, and so you're just like hey i want these for me yeah i just made molds and then i thought maybe you know, as a side thing, I might like cast a few for mm -hmm. friends or sell them on Instagram, something like that. But it wasn't until um, summer of 2020 where I thought, or kind of had to, because with COVID, um, you know, everything shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so I lost the other job indefinitely. But, uh, and I bought some other casts. A lot, most of the casts that I get, I source from Italy. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so many people with great collections there. Yeah. Um, and that are very close to originals. Mm -hmm. Um, or early replicas mm -hmm. so they're just the best quality well so that's what that's like a huge sort of thing i want to talk about because that's like the coolest part to me it's almost like art dealing like you know yeah. white um or whatever that's called like high you know it's not secretive but you have like a connect you have a source where yeah. you get really rare things that other people can't not that you're directly competing with the world but it's fascinating well, and also just to, so everyone's clear that, so there's no like stolen value here. I'm not <laughs> sculpting these. Yeah. Okay. Some okay, people, very, some people yes, let's make that are clear. like, oh wow. And I'm like, 
No, no, no. Michelangelo sculpted this. Yes. Whoever sculpted this, somebody took a mold off of the original or a replica was made mm -hmm. and a mold was made off that. I get that cast. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I have to clean it up. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, these things, it, from each time you make a mold, if you don't do it right, some you lose air, a little fidelity. Yeah, you can lose stuff. some fidelity. Or um, maybe somebody, I like to have a really, really high standard for a clean mm -hmm. cast. Um, maybe if somebody doesn't, there's a bunch of air bubbles. I have to fix that up before making the mold. So um, I touch them a little bit, but I don't, I don't sculpt them. But that's a with. good sort of, you know, thing to say because you're not making yeah. it. But you are still making casts of sometimes 100 yeah. year old there, yeah and there's original there's still some know-how involved in it for of sure. course of course uh, so yeah it's um most of them from italy some but uh also just some a lot in europe mm. what i did was i just um this is a trade secret here i uh <laughs> i just translated gypsateca the part of my business name into french german and spanish and just deep googled that mm -hmm. to see if i could find anybody else that has these things mm -hmm. Um, and found a cool, a few cool ones. There's a museum, a whole museum in Berlin, I believe it's Berlin, definitely in Germany, that has just imagine everything in a museum that you see is mm. available to buy. That's amazing. Like that's what their, I think their collection. And is so from. you could just buy, just like go into a store. Or do, were they trying to size you up? You're obviously, you know, like a professional sculptor. Was that did that help you in any way? Like almost like I the personability of your passion, or that you're just like, all right, buy it. It, here you it go. was just. I just emailed them. I was like, I would like right. this. Yeah. Okay. I don't think anybody like. Yeah. But don't, cares. did you say there's one guy in Italy that's like kind of your guy now that gets really amazing yeah. stuff? I mean, you have yeah. like some of Michelangelo's original things, right? And yeah. Like some of um, the, well, the cool thing is uh, this guy has a lot of full statues, like not just a mass, not just a fragment. Which is insane. Um, it is insane. And one day I want to be able to have full statues, but until then I, I'm, I'm just left with getting these uh, custom fragments made. Um, so like, um, there's a few, there's a, but if you go to Florence in the academia to go to see the David, mm -hmm. the statues before the David are a bunch of these unfinished slaves or mm -hmm. captives that Michelangelo, um, was making for a tomb. And they're still blocks basically. Yeah. Right? Th I think I've yeah. seen them. They're amazing. Cause it's, it's just in a lot of ways, it's, I'm glad they're not finished. Cause you'd really insight into how he made stuff. I mean, yeah. Um, but I have like shocking. the mask of, of one of those called the bearded slave. It's so cool. Um, which was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, it's it's not even a cast that I think I'll ever sell. Like I'll make it available for sale, but I don't think anyone's gonna want it because nobody wants to draw these unfinished forms. Right. It was more like, that's also the reason just like I started this business so I could collect these for myself. Right, of course. Um, it's, a, it's like a personal collection, but also you're like, you know, you, you're like a some sort of tactile time machine, you know? Yeah. And like, you know god forbid something happens to the originals i think about this all the time that, that's what i'm saying i think that's part of it it's yeah. like sort of this archival and yeah. like not many people are doing yeah. it but you have these replicas that are going to maintain that history yeah like not to be like dramatic but no uh, it is just a little if we love to you know who knows dramatic. what happens uh world's crazy right now if something yeah. happens in europe or even nothing malevolent just an earthquake takes out some of these yeah. things it'd be nice to have um a pretty decent copy mm -hmm. um and I believe these these copies would be better than like a currently a, like a 3D scan, 3D print. Totally. But it's also great because you, again, back to the business side, like it's super accessible for students, people like me who, you know, are a fan. I'm not some like historic buff, but I'm a fan. I want to draw these. And you, you like the ones on the table that we'll maybe show later, you do part fragments also, which yeah. only lower the price. Yeah, that was... Um if I can use the word innovation, uh, yeah, I that I think so. that I did. I mean, because there's, there's a few people that do this, right? That have this business. Mm -hmm. um, not that much. There's basically one other company in America that does it. But um, yeah, early on, I was like, how can I make these affordable for people? And one of those is just to certainly make it easy, easier for me to produce, mm -hmm. right? I can certainly lower the cost that way. Um, so what's good about uh, you have a mold of these things, you can cast any part of it mm -hmm. you can cast just an ear mm -hmm. nose eyes whatever um so it's interesting to go back into molds where it makes sense some of them you can't really do it for but some you can just find a whole new composition mm. um, like that drowned girl mask we were talking about the small fragment of that is really cool because where the the way the hair gets cropped it's almost it changes the context a little bit she almost looks like she's wearing like this sort of like religious habit or religious garb interesting um there's a bernini mask i have of a cardinal 
that the crop I did, he has like this kind of about your length hair mm -hmm. and then like this um, like little goatee and mustache. But the way I crop it, it turns it into like this mohawk kind of thing. Whoa. So this like religious figure in the cropping becomes mm -hmm. like a Brooklyn hipster. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of cool to see. That is cool. Um, how the smaller stuff can change, yeah. change how the, the sculpture reads and looks. It's lighter, probably easier to ship. Lighter. Like all these things to, again, push out for people to get yeah. and own more accessibly. Especially the small stuff because um, the, the atelier kind of education is slowly getting into public schools too. That's uh, amazing. Uh, Florence Academy actually ha now offers an MA to, to get teachers that want to teach mm. uh, in those schools uh, to learn the atelier method. Um, but they don't have any sort of budget for casts, yeah. right? Certainly right. not like right. huge masks that are going to be, you know, 200, 300 bucks from other places. But right. so the small stuff also, especially if you're ha giving it to like little kids to handle, totally. you don't want it, yeah. you know, like the, the student, the adult students break these things enough in schools. Yeah. You, you know, I imagine how many um, barg like yeah, things have been absolutely. shattered. Um, and actually what, what I want to do one day is um get some like really really giant like joke shirt made up that mm -hmm. just says i broke a cast and, <laughs> and whenever a school orders them like sends it send it to the school so like uh, uh they can shame the it's students like a dunce that, cap yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> um shame yeah uh but so yeah the the business sort of started in uh, summer 2020 i was starting collecting stuff making the first molds um and then really officially, I'll call it officially started in uh, March 2021. Okay. That's when I made the Instagram. That's so not long ago. No, not at all. And you've had so much success. I mean, we just met a few weeks ago, but I was immediately, I don't I remember. And did you hit me up first? Was it Ken who said that? Or like, I feel like I just saw you through the grapevine or maybe I met, some. I met up with Ken, mm -hmm. Ken Goshen. Shout out Ken Goshen. Yep. Uh, and he was like, you got to talk to, you got to talk to Slew. Okay, nice. Um, so that's how it started. Because yeah. immediately I saw your page. I was like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? Just like a sick feed of casts and sculptures. I'm like, yeah. right, I'm instantly intrigued. And then the business and sort of the thesis of the business, like not only makes so much sense to me, but I think it's just awesome. Yeah. The thing is, I think it's, it's obvious that you have passion and I know that sounds so hippy dippy, but I talk about my business and things. It's like, if you don't have that, it's going to be really hard yeah. to maintain. No, I mean, I think that's important yeah Absolutely. and you clearly have it and, and we're gonna we're gonna i want to talk about your practice obviously also because it's not just your business it's just not about money it's not all no, about absolutely money not, no. but um if, it, if, that, if that were the case there are many things i could have chosen to be in life yeah but it's uh, the perfect balance i mean again your life not to speak for you but like you've maintained your passion your skills you've built now you've built a business around it where you can supplement your passion yeah for an income i mean i do think about it a lot not that you're some hero again also i do think about maybe like <laughs> sometimes feeling like a fraud calling myself a sculptor right well, now or like I, imposter syndrome because i haven't been making so much work i see but at the same time it's like um you do need to pay the bills mm -hmm. uh, and at least this is very much related mm -hmm. to what i do and it's been and it is making me a better sculptor i think because one i get all these things i can i can study these forms up close but then it with making molds and casting, mm -hmm. getting so much practice on that, uh, that's going to come in handy for, for when I have more of my own work to do. Right. I feel like it's also just running through the fundamentals and sort of like becoming a supreme master at sort of like yeah. the baseline knowledge and you know, surrounding yourself. That's why I'm so jealous of like, like when I was at the Students League or like a teacher at Grand Central, it's like teaching, drawing, and just being like, you're just constantly just you know, regurgitating fundamentals to students and just intaking it even more to yourself. I can't imagine how much that would help one's own practice. Yeah. And, uh, I want to start teaching soon mm. for that reason. Like it, that's awesome. Definitely. Cause you know, you can, you can do a painting or sculpt or whatever it is and be right in your own head about how to do it. But then the second you have to tell someone mm -hmm. why you're doing the things, right. You might just like go blank. So it, it'll reinforce what you're doing Yeah. anyway. Yeah. Cause I'm sure you have an internal dialogue while you're working, but then, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Projecting it onto someone else. And so like, was this, cause the coolest project of your personal work, which we were talking about before was like the, the, um, the character you did for red rising. Yeah. And, um, what's his name? Pierce Brown. It, Pierce Brown, which is a super epic book. And we share perhaps that love for fantasy and sci-fi, but how did that come about? I'll definitely hopefully show a picture during this so people can see that came about, um, when I moved to Florence, um, I decided every, everything was going to be about being at the academy. 
um, so I always liked reading, you know, obviously, but and to this day, I've kind of lost the skill of reading a physical book. Mm-hmm. Every time I open a physical book, I just go, there's a million things I should be doing right now. What are you doing? So I switched to audiobooks mm-hmm. when I was in podcasts when I was there. And I was listening to Red Rising for the first time while working on a female torso, life size. Mm-hmm. In your second year there, you do two female, uh, a female and a male torso. And I just decided to title this torso after one of the characters from the books. Tagged him on Instagram, just thought nothing of it. Um, not only did he see it, but he liked it and like shared it on his page, and we just became like Insta- little Instagram. That's buddies. amazing. And then, um, and so that was that would have been uh, 2016, and then in summer of 2019, he just reached out and was like, "I want a sculpture." Wow. The fifth book had just come out, um, and uh, he was doing like a little bit of a book tour, and I met him here, and we talked about which character we're gonna do, and. Mm. Uh, it was great. Kind of a dream commission too. Uh, all credit to him because it was, he was. It was just one of those like, I I like your work, mm-hmm. so just make this. And there was minimal like kind of input. It was just I went off the description, and then my own kind of sensibility. And he trusted your creative. Yeah. The only thing he added, uh, the, the the character's wearing a helmet. He was like, we should do some kill marks on the side. I, 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 I like, remember. That's, of course, we'll yeah. do that. <laughs> I was like, just give me a number. And he was like, forty three. Right. I'm like, that's a number. We'll do it. There we go. Um, so that's cool and it's just i love the books he's a great guy and um the sculpture is on his writing desk mm-hmm. which is just real it's just an honor to do to to know that you know yeah i mean that sounds just like a dream project even for me and my my interests and proclivities uh because on the one hand doing anything sort of like in a creative field like writing painting mm-hmm. sculpting making movies whatever it is music um it sounds really daunting to make a living that way but I think once you remember that art isn't optional, right? Like it is, it is absolutely necessary. It is a requirement for human flourishing mm. and human happiness. Um, that kind of fortifies like my choice mm. to, to be an artist is that I know now um, not everybody's going to particularly in the culture today, maybe ha- like share everything that you think is beautiful. Right. Um, or good art, you could say. Like right. you and Ken talked about this, like this idea about beauty, and I, I definitely am a proponent. And uh, yeah, that, he know. went off on that, yeah. and said it so eloquently, and I agree. Yeah, I absolutely agree too. Yeah. And it's um, that can be tough um, when maybe uh, you make things that you think uh, kind of reflect that, mm. but uh, people, for whatever reason, don't want to or don't think it's as important. Mm. Um, but at the same, you know, I always think too, like there's some people that, uh, my art wouldn't even be for, you know, like there's a certain, there's a certain amount, a certain percentage of the population, probably greater than 10%, but certainly lower than 50% that looks at the David and their first thought is, oh, tiny piece. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it's like, I'm sure those are great people, but Mm -hmm. I have nothing i don't want anything to do with 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 art yeah. for the, like talking about art it's just like if a lot of these sculptures like if the, yeah. fir- the nudity of it is like maybe the fifth thing i notice uh, you yeah. know um so like those people aren't um necessarily my target i hear you and that makes know. so much sense and it's like god bless everyone you know art it's all subjective but it's clearly in this world there's clearly a yeah. bubble of what who it's for you know there is there's some intellectuality about it you know you almost need to understand how it's made who made it why it was made the the process all these things to help sort of deliver it the viewing it i think about that at the same time i think i don't know i don't um, think that's necessary but it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly not necessary. there's context yeah is what i'm saying yeah um because sometimes like for instance uh i'm actually really bad at like analyzing art in general but particularly like paintings mm-hmm. i don't know the language of paint mm. um so for me, I, I just, I just like to look at it. And sometimes it's this idea of like, you know, when you, I don't know, you're at a concert, maybe you don't know the band and like, you're trying to, like, you're sitting there, you're enjoying it, but you're trying to like mm. pick out all the words and it would have just been better if you just like hummed along. Yeah. I think a lot of, that's like, a good analogy. I think a lot about this when looking at art, it's like, just, just look at it. Yeah. Just, if it's a sculpture, move around it. 
um, and don't worry about because this is a this is a major thing back to college. I love shitting mm-hmm. on college. Um, <laughs> Or you, you get stuffed respectfully, in this, of course. You just get stuffed in this uh, crit room, and you have to come up with things to say about these these things in front of you. Yeah. And there's just nothing there. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes it's better just to try to experience whatever it is. Yeah. Um, even even like non representation art, there's a lot of abs- abstract art um, that I love to look at. Mm. That's interesting. I think it's so true. I mean, I almost feel the same way that you said about painting with sculpture because it's like, you know, it's like I have this filter as a painter and like I've studied it. I'm really into it. And so I've said this before. The first thing I'm looking at actually in museums at paintings isn't like the iconography, what that represents. It's how the painter made it looking at like the value structure Mm -hmm. or looking at skin tones, his color. So it's like more of that engineering archetype that is instantly what builds my curiosity, not like, what the Cyclops means yeah. or what religious, you know, depiction it is. And so I think that's just my filter. And as you as a sculptor probably innately have that sculpting filter. Yeah. So for me, at least, uh, I think we're drawn to the things that we venerate. And for me, like with sculpture, it's like all about form, mm. um, to the point where like narrative almost doesn't really matter. Mm. Like I could, I could, I could sculpt a torso and call it, Apollo or whatever. Right. Uh, it has really has nothing. I mean, I love mythology. It has nothing. It's less about it being a statue of Apollo, which there are thousands of, mm-hmm. and it's more about just the form to it. Um, uh, one thing I like to think about, and this was a major um, kind of breakthrough at, when I was in Florence, because uh, thinking about an undergrad, there was this, this tension between like representational and you know abstract mm-hmm. art thinking that they're completely exclusive. In Florence, I learned they're actually very much intertwined and inclusive. There's so much abstraction in nature. So when, I, when I'm looking at a sculpture or making my own, the idea is, or one of the ideas, is if I were to take, just zoom in on my piece and just take this window and look at that as it's, you know, is, is that comp, does that make a good composition? Mm. Just like, you know, you zoom in on like a rib cage. Right. Um, and like a back. If, yeah, a back, certainly. There's like that whole landscape. Yeah. Um, and if, if these these small windows kind of stand on their own mm. and then integrate as a whole from, mm. and standing back and being the whole thing, you, then you're on your way to a good sculpture. That's awesome. And so, yeah, the, yeah, that's, it's almost like, yeah, a, a bunch of wonderful composed forms that make a bigger form yeah but the name and that doesn't really matter at the end of the day does and not doesn't necessarily have to right. i mean sometimes you you know there's you know allegorical sculptures whatever you're trying to get something across it does matter what does allegorical mean um i think like like you would make a sculpture called diligence right and it would be like a beekeeper because like oh, bees work really okay. hard right. the bee, you know it's like a uh, metaphor yeah a visual form or yeah something. yeah good word But that, no, that's fascinating. And that's like, yeah. And so like you just went on a trip to Paris, right? I did. And you probably saw thousands of sculptures. And so what are you doing then? You're just, you know, like what, what we were just talking about, did did that come up? Like, are you just taking it for what they are? Are you looking specifically at certain artists? Like, it's just so interesting your perspective Um, as a, as a sculptor, like these people who are so weathered and amazing. I'm just curious. My first thing when I, when I go to museums, and I'm glad I do these trips alone for the most part. I mean, it'd be cool to have someone with me, but uh, just the way I do it, mm-hmm. it's kind of taxing and maybe not as... Well, walking 15 miles. Yeah. And... Um, so I, I just walk around. So, and one thing I love to do is not know what's there. Ooh. Like in Rome, my first trip to Rome, I didn't really know what was in the Vatican. And I would just be walking and I was like, oh, Belvedere Torso. Oh, mm-hmm. Loyaka one. I didn't know they were there. Wow. Um, so exploring that way in Paris too is great. Um, but what I, I typically do is something will catch my eye, something about a sculpture. I'll go over, I'll, I'll walk around it a bunch. I'll take a bunch of photos of different angles and like croppings of it just uh, to store it in my head and just mm-hmm. look at later. Um, and I almost never, I always look at it first before looking at who did it and the title or anything like that. Cause mm-hmm. I just want to, I want to get like that. blank slate. Yeah. Just that, like first. that humming along first uh, kind of view. I love that analogy, um, dude. And um, one I can I can recall off the top of my head, it's in the Petit Palais. It's called the First Funeral, and it's a, a sculptural group of Adam and Eve carrying the son, 
carrying their the body of um, Abel, mm. um, which I believe in that story. Multi figure, yeah. Um, so he gets killed by his brother, and it's, but you don't need that title mm -hmm. to know that sculpture is great when you look at it, just because the way it's composed, it's just so well designed. Um, these two standing figures, and then their son is draped across the uh, the father's holding him. So they, then you have this vertical, and there's just like limbs everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just um, everything's there's so much variation, but mm -hmm. it's still integrated well. My favorite quote is um, variation is better enjoyed under unity. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah. I didn't absolutely. mean to interrupt. No, but absolutely. That perfect. <laughs> and so there's so much to love about it just as just as a practitioner of sculpture mm. and just like handling material. Also, it's just, it's in marble, it's in stone. Um, so th that's a whole other element. But then, then looking at it, the title is called The First Funeral. And then you start looking about it as a story. And what's interesting there, how the anatomy helps with the story because the, um, from the side view, you can tell the way he did it, the, the backs of the standing figures are going in completely opposite directions because Adam is the one holding all of the weight. Mm. Like it looks like Eve is carrying like the front of her son, but she's, he's taking all the weight. So his okay. back is, his back is like arched back. And then she like, she's leaning in right. uh, and just cradling his head uh -huh. and it's full of emotion. Whereas he, he's more like, uh, almost like it hasn't hit him yet. He's just like holding. Yeah. You know? So there's like so wow. much and like that, you can tell without the title, but if you know like that story mm -hmm. and then like the title just kind of helps it along. Wow. So, um, yeah, but, uh, I always look at the form first and then maybe go into narrative later. And then for my own work, um, the same thing, because not everybody's going to know the story. Mm -hmm. Um, not every, cause I don't really, I'm not a fan of really drawn out artist statements and things like that. So it's, it's nice yeah. if it can just stand on its own merits. Yeah. And then if you know, there's something you write about it. Great. But, well, I think that's the truth also. I mean, it's like even, and there's a lot of things, a lot of work I'm actually working on is like a painting with like a short story attached. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like people are going to look at the painting and decide whatever they want, you know, yeah. or have, they don't even want to know the context. It's just going to be there and for people to ingest as any way they want, really. Yeah. Um, yeah and I mean, that's okay. I think mm -hmm. um, like when you admire something, um, you're like, you're saying yes to it and mm -hmm. that, everybody can have a different yes mm. i think um i like that too can we talk about like the process of sculpting and everything and like so you in because florence the the program it's all clay yes mostly and that's like also sort of the widely used before if you want to cast it in a metal or anything else clay is the yeah unanimous material yeah yeah, you got to sculpt in clay. I mean, the the difference there would only be between water-based clay or oil-based clay. Okay. And not so, again, sorry to interrupt. At Florence, you're not sculpting marble at all? No. Okay. Not in, not in the program. There and that's are, generically, uh, ateliers don't have that in their program. It's to learn anatomy and create form with clay, not sculpt. Marble. Yeah, I think um, it would be cool to have it to offer to more advanced students. Mm -hmm. Um but you you really if you can't make like a convincing <laughs> eye and clay you're certainly not gonna be able to do it that in makes stone. sense um that makes sense so i yeah, just wanted to get that clear yeah there's no marble curious, yeah. in the program um I'm trying to think if there are if i know it. i mean there's there's a usually in italy what you do is you just go to the marble there's workshops mm -hmm. like there's there's towns that are like famous for yeah. pietro santa uh, where you go to carrara and take a workshop there um, cause it's just, it's close to the marble. It's <laughs> like, you know, um, so yeah. Uh, sculpting in clay yeah. is, is how things go there. Yeah. That's very cool. And I just, I'm just curious. So like, can we, can we perhaps bring over one of these sure. and can you talk about, cause this is a fragment and I'm, I would just like, you're like, you're talking about it and describing it. Like the pro, the, like just the process, and maybe also I can overlay some of the, the process from of ca the process of casting. This? Yeah, the process of casting, but also then I want to talk about like maybe your um, the cauliflower ear series, and just mm. like you know go through, just run a little A to Z on like you know yeah. executing a project for sure. So the the original of this comes from a marble. Okay. So traditionally, the way a marble sculpture is going to be executed is you're going to sculpt something in clay, then you're going to have a copy made in plaster. 
Um, and this plaster is going to serve as the model mm -hmm. to, to translate those forms into stone. Because stone's very expensive. Right. And if you mess it up, like that's it. So basically the, the way they would do it is they would have your, your plaster model. And then they use a lot of measuring. There's this tool um, called a pointing machine. Oh, is that where like the depth of it? Yeah, like, uh, I'm not the best person to explain this, but um, <laughs> basically, you you measure key, you you make certain points on the plaster so that your measuring device will always be on yeah. equal terms when you shift it. I see, I see. And then you take points and you you mark them on the marble, and you know that's how far uh -huh. you're going in. Gotcha. Um, so it's a bit of a process. Oh. That's what's so cool about Michelangelo, because it's every. I mean, I don't. I'd hate for a historian to call me out right now, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that we know that he didn't do that okay he just went right at that stone because you can like you can okay so, so you're saying he didn't do something before he didn't do like a he draft. might have had a model but i don't think he's pointing machines wow um what the heck yeah he just he just went at the stone um and then yeah so that you'd have your plaster model or clay model get a plaster and then use that to carve i see um, and then fin and then things get finished by hand. Yeah. Certainly, like the artist can make decisions in the, in the moment mm -hmm. too. Um, that might not have even been in the clay because the materials are so different. Um, you know, stone in particular is very, very flesh-like. So you can maybe, maybe when you have it in front of you, you make a few other moves in the in the stone that you wouldn't have done in the clay or mm. whatever. Um, this particular one uh, is cast in aqua resin. Okay. And uh, it's it's the same process as with plaster. It's just a slightly different material. Right. You're saying it's a um, bit structurally more yeah, sound. When I started the business, I did. I was thinking like maybe I'd offer them an aqua resin because mm -hmm. um, it's much stronger and lighter weight. So I thought from practical, I would like cut down on shipping and then this thing would yeah, get broken. Right. But you don't get the same white uh, color that people are really looking for when they're drawing and painting these values. Mm -hmm. So I ultimately decided not. So these are like very like early on. Yeah. Um, yeah, before we were talking about painting this, I don't think you're right. A neutral gray would probably not be the play. It would be as bright white as you can go, right? Yeah, it's just some sort of lighter color. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and then, so that's like how, you, how you're going to produce a marble. Uh, and bronze, uh, I mean, marble and bronze are like the main kind of ultimate finish. Ultimate finish. Um, right. Pieces. Like mm -hmm. that's the material that people are going to um, want things in. Yeah. I mean, now you have resins, you have all these foam, you have all these materials, but... Uh, traditionally, it's it's either marble or bronze. Bronze um, is also. I'm also maybe not the best person to talk about it because I still regard some of that process as magic. Like I know the alchemy. Of I it. know how it works, mm -hmm. but I also don't know how it works. I'm very confused. Like you, um, you have you make your clay model. You have a mold. You cast that in wax, mm -hmm. and then there's a few different ways to go from there. But basically, that wax um, gets burned out. And then, and then the form that it gets burnt new, out within a yeah, so shell I, I of guess, like yeah, sand. And yeah, it's, this, stuff. it's like this, this it's called ceramic shell. It's this kind of liquid goop. You dip the wax in it's it. And then you dip this uh, liquid with silica, different mm -hmm. grits of silica. Mm -hmm. And eventually that builds up to a, a certain thickness. Um, and then you burn out the wax and it leaves a perfect impression yeah. in this, this shell, the yeah. ceramic shell you've made. And then bronze gets poured yeah, into yeah. that. Um, so what part of that don't you understand? Well, there's, there's how some, awesome it works. <laughs> there's just some part. Like I remember doing it in college. Um, we would do these foam castings where you bury foam in sand. Mm. Uh, and like then the it, spray foam. Uh, or like like that, one of your torsos. You it was more of like studio? the blue, blue and pink, like styrofoam you use. Oh, for, okay, yeah, okay. Like okay. that type of foam. And you'd bury it in the sand. And then when you pour the bronze in, just instantly the bronze replaces the space where the foam was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's just some parts to it um, <laughs> that... Well, it is magic. It is yeah. amazing. I mean, seeing the photos of your, um, the Red Rising sculpture, I mean, it's just, I want that. Like, it's Thank the you. coolest shit ever. I mean, yeah. it's also big. Yeah. Like, it's pretty big. I like, that's one thing I, I probably need to get better at sculpting smaller because like people can't really invest the money or certainly have the space to mm. just have a life size figure. Or but whatever. you love it. You love going big. I, I like, I don't know. I just like that scale or if not bigger. Do you have a reason why? Um, perhaps part of it is just when you can when you there's a certain scale that becomes too big and then you start to generalize things just mm. by definition but uh or by necessity but at some point making things a little bit bigger you can really go in and explore the forms 
like that my series of the pugilist ears um these three times life size cauliflower ears um if i were to make them just the size of an ear it's also just really tedious getting in that small and right. that can be frustrating yeah. so just expanding a little bit gives you more room to maneuver because uh, you can always especially now like like sculpt a life-size figure then scan it and then produce it at a, at a smaller scale if you yeah. wanted to um but uh i do want to get better at making smaller stuff because it, it just changes uh changes the feel of it too like when you when you set out to sculpt something small it compared to a life size it, it becomes more like a jewel mm. maybe than like this, this big mm-hmm. um this big thing um but and I, the life size too there's certain there's certain things too that's just a little bit easier you know like when you're not sculpting tiny little details totally. when it's when it's life size you can just measure if you need to right off the model yeah um and i don't know there's a, there's an ambition to it like when i was in paris seeing rodin's work mm-hmm. not necessarily his forms although he, he has like some great uh components to his sculpture but just like the scale and yeah. the ambition of it i'm like i need to go make right multi i need to make like a six um six individual figure like sculpture not a six figure sculpture but that's insane um, just do just make things big well but. because that's what i'm thinking off the top is like when you go see sculptures everywhere whether it's like some bronzing in new york or the old masters in italy or in europe they are usually what like seven or eight feet yeah right like they're, they're life like size or above idealized above and so you're consuming sculpture at that scale so seeing things you know less or you know half scale it's like you don't really see it often uh, and so they're not out in public, right? It's more in public. museums, like or, it, or personal work or whatever yeah, people yeah, want to yeah. do. But that's yeah. what I'm just thinking of, like, like the the precedent was almost set that it's like, okay, we're going one to one or we're going bigger. Yeah, but it makes sense because it's like literally the most epic thing. There is a room though in Paris in uh, the Louvre that has, it's just full of these amazing half life and half life size is another scale that most people okay. in school are familiar with. That's like what is you're going to sculpt. Two? Yeah. Okay. Um, but this room, it just has maybe about 20, 25, just beautiful okay. half life size sculptures. And what it was, it was a chance for, um, basically sculptures to flex and just show mm-hmm. what they could do. These were all reception pieces to get into the Academy. Okay, so nice. every single one is just a showcase of the artist being able to render, uh, the nude form drapery, mm. uh, movement, get the anatomy right. And the natural environment and sometimes animals and objects and things like that so just every single one is just like that's amazing and one sense it's a it's a masterpiece but it's also um it's hard to explain almost but they're almost almost forgetful in some way because they don't have that because they were just like these pieces just to get into the school right Mm -hmm. it's basically a student work in a way Mm -hmm. it doesn't um go beyond um that strictly academic kind of thing. I think I know what you're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, there, there's all kinds of work that I've made and I think people have made in school that you're super proud of, but it's like that, it was done in a different setting. Yeah. You know, maybe your teacher had a little bit of a hand in it, things like that. Interesting. It's not you yet, um, but it's still a marvel to look at the, those pieces and, right. and think about that scale too, just half life size scale. I mean, it's got to be bigger Thir- than that. 36 right? inches. That's half? Well, I guess. You're six feet, 72 inches, right? around that yeah i mean that math checks out but so you went like this i was like that doesn't oh yeah I, I, yeah about more like that yeah that's so cool so what do you so speaking of all this awesome like do you have i know you're working on a few things right now you had like another character i don't know if this yeah. is a secret or something no it's certainly not a secret um, another character you're working on that's pretty big yeah like his a, back looked like bane yeah it's a big <laughs> just torso it's, it's from the so the thing about the the red rising sculpture is so many of the fans wanted copies which made me feel good, but it was just like a, a one one off for Pierce, yeah. and then I have like a, a proof, like artist proof for me. Um, so I just decided I was re listening to the books and just decided to um, make mm. another character just for fun. It's a fan favorite character too. So amazing when it's eventually done. It's been like a year and a half, two years in the works now. Um, I think it'll be fun, um, and it, but it's more like um, I think with with your work, you almost have to have like a higher hierarchy of values in it mm-hmm. like i agree um certainly like for those ears that i've made um anybody if anybody doesn't know um be careful googling this but cauliflower ear is the thing that happens to uh, people that train jiu-jitsu wrestlers yep. mma fighters and their ears just get really messed up yep but um 
I love sculpting ears. I think ears are amazing forms. And, and we're talking about like the sort of abstraction of that. So yeah. It's like there's, perfectly there's, aligned. It, all my interest really has the abstraction in it. Um, it. With those particular ones, I enlarge the scale a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but then you could also argue that there's like a little bit of conceptual in there because, um, and I've never trained any of this. Like I've never trained in martial arts. So maybe real fighters out there would be like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. But that, <laughs> like you see cauliflower, cauliflower out in the world, you're like, that guy knows how to handle himself. Totally. That guy's trained a lot. He's been through things. Yeah. He's um, gone through something. And on the other end, he's, I'm assuming, better off for it. Um, yeah. So thinking about all that and kind of housed in that. Totally. Project. And I think that's completely valid because it's like, it's like a very iconographic thing that is paired with some sort of story or process of going yeah. through something like you said, but it's also so cool just seeing it not attached to a head. Yeah. You know, it's just like this ear and you know what it is immediately. Yeah. But it's not attached to, cause like you're so, this is my life portraiture, you know, YouTube eyes, nose, mouth, you know, this Mr. Potato head, different sizes, different placements. But this is, this is one thing I, I learned too. I, I really liked about the, um, the kind of atelier sort of curriculum sometimes is you often, will sculpt sort of fragments, right? Cause mm -hmm. you don't want to take a, an early student, just give them a, a model and do tell them to do a full life size figure. Yeah. Like it'll be just be insane. It'll yeah. be, they'll be sculpting Probably circles. Be yeah. They won't learn a lot. Um, so when you break things down to fragments, um, you get this really interesting thing that happens where like you're doing a torso, right? So, you know, even though like we talked about like the narrative, you can certainly do it with the title, but you lose a lot when there's no portrait or mm -hmm. even when there's no hands mm -hmm. like hands and portraits are so expressive yeah um so it's kind of a challenge to 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 really make something have like a narrative quality without all that information totally. and that's when it comes to knowing your anatomy mm -hmm. um designing a sculpture well um and then just making that form really interesting and unpredictable um so that's i, I kind of like that um aspect of like like zooming in on the human body and like just mm -hmm. picking up like the ear or a part of the torso. Um, also sort of by necessity for me too, is I haven't been able to in my current studio really hire models down. It's like in a basement. So right. I don't want to like okay. hire models to come into this creepy basement. It's weird. So, yeah. um, and you desire that. That's what you're saying. A space to have models. Yeah. yeah. Cause you want models. I mean, yeah. I think every artist, we share yeah. that in our practice. Like I'm going to expand the, um, the kind of off the ears like those will be part of like this this kind of show i'm planning but i want to have uh, incorporate um uh, like find some local mma mm. guy to pose for like a few torso sculptures things like oh, that. oh cool yeah um because uh i get if people if it's not their people's not their bag to, to watch mma but yeah. uh if you can get past like the crazy brutality of it all um you see the body do some incredible things totally um like uh I'm generally that way. Like it's going to sound really flowery and like poetic, but like seriously, like somebody, sometimes somebody like reaching up to hold onto the bar on the subway, like just like just remembering how kinetic the human body is and mm. how it all works really well. We don't even give it a second thought. Uh, but then seeing that done in situations like really, really extreme. Yeah. Combat um, sport. Yeah. Um, Cause a lot of it, I think, so much about making art and sculpture is problem solving. Mm. And that's kind of what I regard MMA as it's and high level problem solving totally. with dire physical consequences. Totally. So, it's, and that's, that's perfect um, kind of ground for exploring human like figurative art. That's, I think. that's well said. I think I completely agree. I mean, jujitsu is a total language, you know, yeah. um, physically. That's so funny. And that, I don't think that's too like hippy dippy or poetic, but it's like you as an artist, you have that again, like that filtered lens of like, you know, just seeing someone grab the, you know, the thing on the subway, it's like, oh, good strike yeah. a nerve. I see that all the time. I'm looking at like my mom talking to her and like some lights bouncing off her face. Right. I'm like, oh shit. Like I'm not even listening to yeah. you talk right now. I'm just looking at the glint on your nose or something like that. Yeah. And then the other thing too, like, um, shout out my mom, shout out love you. Mom. <laughs> um, is, uh, you know, you're making art and you're looking at art that hopefully the, the goal is to, reflect back into the world mm. your values you think um, so for you you believe that absolutely that's because like, we deal so much in abstractions mm -hmm. all the time abstract kind of ideas that art like you need some way to concretize it and art is like 
one of the best ways to do it. Mm. I mean, just think of all the resources the church put into art, right? Yeah. Because you have all these like these you know religious ideas, morality, truth, beauty, whatever it is, um, or or even like some of the the negative sides. Like you see all these like saints going like through hell and stuff like that. That mm -hmm. like for people that couldn't read back then or whatever it yeah. was, um, the ideas come across through the art. Well, sure, and I think it's a it's a it's a vehicle for them to yeah. you know control the narrative yeah. visually. Sure. But then, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I agree with that also. It's a pie yeah, chart of yeah. things. Yeah, that that's that certainly is a way to do it. <laughs> but um, but then for me, which I think would be better is is to instead of like a sort of element of control is more like express what humans could be, should mm. be, ought to be. Mm. Um, like you look at the David, any of all, well, not any, but a lot of the different Davids, right? Like Michelangelo's David, yeah. certainly. Um, Verrocchio. Ber Bernini's David, especially like these are um competent men mm. right these are and that's what i think about like in with this explain this idea of like um like these mma sculpture right it's like i'm not a fighter yeah. not particularly big or strong but it's like you know you you reflect things maybe back to like what you would want to attain to idea yeah um, yeah and it's not that i want to like go you know get an octagon anywhere but like um, you look up to them in that in that sense of like yeah. their profession and their skills. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and just even just as a terms of like you you don't even need to have any interest in um, fighting to to be able to pull out like the certain dedication and yeah. discipline of exactly. a fighter. Oh, completely. Like, you, you could translate into like if you're like if your thing is I don't know chess whatever it is yeah. like, just whatever it is that you need to be disciplined at you can see how you know someone like or like uh, like looking at like David Goggins if you know him someone yeah. like that yeah mm -hmm. just like. Um, yeah, you can't you can't not respect it, and I would almost go to the point of like, you know, it's u ubiquitously respected just the sheer dedication work, or tr like you said, training in chess, like the yeah. ten hours a day they put in studying and whatever it is, magic, yeah. right? No, yeah. So that those, I mean, I just I'm moving into new studio, so I have so many. The only limiting factor for me is time. Hey, I that's really, so exciting. Really wish all of these thoughts could, are just jumbled in your head. I really wish I could survive off like three hours of sleep. Something really because like um, there's just so many sculptures I want to make um, have you had this for a while only in this new exciting chapter of your life getting a new studio your business is going really well are you just fluttered with motivation yeah I mean I, there's always been ideas for things like of there's um, and what's what's great too is I I can basically see like how I want these things to look like That's the most there's, a, there's a few of them that I've been planning for years like mm. some ideas that just haven't been executed yet but i can see perfectly nice. um how it's gonna look um or you know you say that and then like you get a model and then maybe the model shows you just because that's the that's the great thing about working from life right and people ask me this all the time um or just ask this of any kind of traditional artist like oh why don't you take a photo and it's like <laughs> sure um yeah. but there's so much more you can get yeah. from from working from life mm -hmm. um and that's one thing that we kind of teach not we, but was taught to us at yeah. Florence Academy is um, I think you can say we. You uh, you leave yourself some flexibility. Mm -hmm. This is one thing I had to work on because you just like you want to get clay up there, you want to get to a finished product. But um, that model is alive, thankfully, mm -hmm. and will move and maybe sink into the pose and, and give you something on a different day that might be more interesting. Right. And then if you if you've locked yourself into this pose on day one or two, well now it's like this because. Once you see something better, you can't unsee it. Yeah, um, <laughs> ain't that and, the truth? Yeah. And uh, you can evade that all you want, but if mm -hmm. you know, so it's best to like leave yourself flexibility. So um, even though I have all these projects in mind, like it'll be different once I have someone totally in front of me. But I think that's like an important step. And obviously, you're like you know a pretty masterful artist and craftsman, so you have that. But I think that's like the biggest thing that hinders people and or you know that people it, it separates artists like the never running out of added ideas you know yeah. you don't almost don't have enough room for ideas and like you said visualizing like that's sort of like the definition of like a visionary if you really like peel apart that definition is like literally making something how you're going to do it what it's going to look like again it may change yeah. but visualizing that all before you actually start to give you like that first roadmap i think it definitely helps yeah um like some i don't i don't know if i necessarily believe in it but maybe i do like this idea of manifesting things mm -hmm. Like, um, I'll, like, I'll just be, usually when I'm working, I'm listening to something, either music, podcast, audiobook. Mm -hmm. but in the, the, the spaces where I'm walking to my studio or walking back or walking to get a snack or whatever, 
even though something's playing, I'm probably not paying attention. I'm <laughs> trying to not get hit by a car either. Yeah, yeah. So it's those times where I'm just like really imagining mm-hmm. like what the sculpture will look like. Um, and like what a show, like a solo show in New York would look like yeah. all these things. Um, and I think if, if you constantly keep it in your head, then you'll only, it's only like ever good. I think for that. Totally. I think it's just another way to say like pre-visualizing manifesting it's yeah. I think it's all one and the same, especially if you actually put in good hours of work, you know? Yeah. I everyone. Mean, that's the thing I always say to everyone. It's like, everyone has good ideas. Everyone yeah, can you, dream, you need to put hours <laughs> but in not studio. everyone works. their fucking, that's the biggest brain dead. That's the biggest thing. Probably people say like, like we were talking about earlier, like how do you be successful as an artist? Mm-hmm. There's really no, um, replacement for yeah. time in the studio. Right. Now I say that maybe there is like, um, maybe, um, maybe you get in with like some gallery owners, some, some board members, something like that. Yeah. But like, that's not, I don't think that's a recipe for long-term no, success and not realistic um, and not realistic. So but I then the gallery is still going to want you to pump out work. And who's yeah. Gonna do that I wouldn't work? bank on that. I yeah. would try to, if you can try to do something where, um, it's like self-generated. Mm. Um, cause I, like, I would prefer, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are tons of galleries out there that really hustle for their artists and really, it is a really great partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just trying to avoid that. I'm just trying to, Me too. Hey, you're like, preaching the choir. I've never know. been in that. I've never been in a gallery setting. I've been painting like seriously for six years and had whatever success, but I have no idea what that world's like yeah. and don't desire it at all. Yeah. But like, that's the thing. It's like, it's really fun to have these conversations and talk like, you know, intellectually about things and give advice and sound like some life coach, which I hate sounding like, but I feel like I do sometimes sadly, yeah. but well, at the end of the day, it's like, we're working, you know, like, yeah, you're leaving. I'm working. These paintings don't paint out. themselves. And, you know, thinking about like, the gallery thing, cause like everybody has like a different idea of what they want their work to look like mm-hmm. too, or uh, how their work is represented. Like I know artists that sculptors, the only, they reach a certain point now they only ever cast and sell in bronze that's pretty cool and i get but that i also i get that that where you like you have you want your work to have this be elevated to the certain standard standard but for me not only in terms of just like earning a living but mm-hmm. i truly do believe what i said earlier the art is not optional mm. um and not everybody's gonna be able to pay for a bronze totally um but they still want to surround themselves with art and mm-hmm. beauty. Um, so one reason I've never wanted to go with the gallery either is that I want to be able to have like, sure, an addition of 10 or 12 or whatever the number is of bronze is for somebody that wants that material or has mm-hmm. the money for something like that. But also even like an open edition, unnumbered, mm-hmm. cast as many as the mold can handle in a plaster or a resin for people that are on a budget or just, yeah. you know, want this, but only want to spend a certain amount of money. And, but you know, you tell a collector that they might not be down with. Yeah. Well, because they like have this weird, like they want to own you. They're yeah. like, this is the only way yeah. place to get Justin's work. Yeah. Or or this idea, that, you know, I like I would much rather sell like a ton of plaster fragments from one of my sculptures, right? To people that are gonna put them in their homes, mm-hmm. gonna contemplate them, yep. and have that like really be impactful in their life then only be allowed to sell three bronzes that get put in someone's like summer home yeah you know well that's the this is like the this is like my life and and my business it's like i don't sell originals but i sell prints yeah and like a lot of youtubers and people like me who are like internet artists who like have followings and you have now this like bigger number of people who are interested in your work it's like these are 16 to 20 year old kids that don't want to pay like two grand for a painting. They want to pay 50 bucks for a yeah. print, you know, and a sticker pack. And that's just, you know, they are supporting you. They're interested in your work and they're getting a product. And yeah. I think it's genius. And also for you, just me just ranting right now, like I think that shows people, especially the people who are following you that you're more sort of like in that realm of, authenticity and you're doing things because you love it and like there's you know side stories and pie charts of different you know agendas of why you make work but that you could also do the one-of-one bronze like that thing with um pierce yeah but um i think it's great and it's a great idea yeah and well and it separates you like you know it's like that's like the real artist and again i'm sorry if i'm beating this like a dead horse but like that is why social media is so great is because it's like you don't need this you know overarching 
evil warlord gallery, you know, kind of telling you what to do. Of course, I'm sure if a big gallery wanted to represent you, that would be awesome. Yeah, I think it. But, just, I think you just need to have a conversation with them and, yeah. and see how it is, because you know, some somewhat exclusivity to your work, which mm-hmm. is, that could be cool. Sure, uh, you know, but if it doesn't work for you, yeah. Uh, the thing I like about the print idea too is like, um, if we're gonna go with the idea that people need art, like remember, it doesn't it doesn't have to cost you like like so many. You can like with the way printers are, you can get a really really high mm-hmm. quality print of your favorite painting or whatever it is. 20 bucks oh the framing sure. is gonna be the thing that, yeah you know you can you can surround yourself with art yeah. on a budget for sure i mean totally etsy um, you could buy a poster of yeah. like you know lot and his daughters at the met that's like fucking yeah 20 feet or whatever not that big but yeah you get that for 20 bucks and this is again i'm so interested in 3d printing actually and maybe that's like blasphemous to you the world but let me just run this by you yeah, see what you think it. this is off the rip like you, your next, um, the next Red Rising character, it's super big. Maybe you'll do another one of one bronze cast. Maybe you could auction that off. Maybe you make a plaster, of, but it's still big, right? What if you then did, you had someone LIDAR scan that, and then you can make five inch, 10 inch, um, 3D printed versions yeah. of that, sell them for, 30 bucks yeah. would you ever be interested in something like that because to me that could be lucrative yeah i think about this and i know a lot of friends of mine were are doing this where they sculpt in their life size mm-hmm. and then they will have the clay scanned mm-hmm. and then they can produce additions at a smaller scale mm-hmm. um i kind of go back and forth on it and sometimes i feel like there's like contradictions in my ideas mm-hmm. um, about it but Overall, I think I'd be as if like anybody needs my justification. No, but, well, this is um, your podcast. I would dude, be. We want the opinion. More inclined if I or I or whoever you sculpted it first, and then it gets reduced that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but isn't that what's happening, or no? Well, it is, but step? but well, but a lot of the time it's like. Um, like artists have no hand like in that in that ex- example the artist clearly had a hand in it mm-hmm. a lot of the times it's they just farmed it, like a jeff coons type of thing or whatever or whoever where they have no hand in it it's just it's been 3d it's been farmed out to oh, some yeah, fabricator yeah. to be 3d modeled right. and then printed and you know i don't know i think you could definitely use it any technology i'm like it, it's 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 not good or bad it's just how you how you use it there right. are some things where it makes sense, like um, if you're going to be sculpting, like a uh, figure holding an object, like uh, an artist friend of mine um, uh, sculpt this figure, and she's holding like a fire hydrant. Mm-hmm. She's folding these. I don't, I don't really think you need to sculpt a fire hydrant necessarily mm-hmm. at that point. Um, so that's a, that was I'm pretty sure a 3D printed element. Okay. Um, for my own work, uh, it just depends. I'll have to think mm-hmm. um, on if I. Because if, if it's going to be smaller, there's part of me that thinks, like, I'll just make it small. I'll just make a smaller mm-hmm. copy if I have time mm-hmm. or inclination to. Um, if I can get, if I could get, r- like, a really high fidelity scan mm-hmm. and print so that mm-hmm. it, it looks very, like, as good as it can mm-hmm. to what I sculpted, mm-hmm. uh, maybe I'd be open to it. Because um, just my brain instantly, it's like, I see no difference to that process. Like, again, an original thing that you sculpted out of clay, original and it being 3D scanned into rep- reproduced. I have no, how is that different from like an original painting being photographed and scanned and made into prints? You know, it's like yeah. the same thing and it just gives, you know, it's your it's your decision, obviously. I'm not saying you should or should not, but like it just seems like a great way to, you have your desire to do whatever you want and then yeah. give it to people. The only difference, I think it's harder to maintain the integrity um, because it's in 3D, right? Okay. Like you can, yeah. like a painting can get, print it out and more or less be like maybe you lose some of the like if it's like a very like heavily kind of painted painting yeah um you lose some of that quality but like with um i may and i don't really explore 3d printer right. but also maybe maybe for all i know like they're doing it now where you don't see the print lines so you're saying but the like, quality you, yeah, you, you yeah. just really want to control that yeah you know i have some really crazy 3d prints i just bought you want yeah. me to show you yeah, yeah. so we can talk Let's about them because i've seen really good quality ones before and these, this oh, is yeah, a company yeah. I just hit up because I want to do the same thing where I want to like lay them super interestingly yeah. and then um, paint and draw them just as reference. You know, these aren't, you can see some of the lines, but these are pretty sick, I think, you know? 
We're going to get the yeah. hardest professional opinion. Yeah, here. these are, I mean, these are certainly higher quality than I've seen. Um, and that was like 25 bucks typically. per. Yeah. And I don't know how long they take to print. I'm guessing a few hours, maybe a lot more. Maybe it's like an eight hour print. Yeah. I'd certainly be open to something like that. Um, because again, I'm just saying like, uh, just again, this is, please tell me to shut up, but like your red rising, there's so many fans, like the nerd culture, again, just from yeah. a business standpoint, you can't sleep on those nerds. I'm, I'm assuming there's, you know, possibly thousands of people. Yeah. They would want a really nice character again with the story of a professional artist sculpting. It's not just some 3d guy on blender, which is like right, a right, program right. doing sure. it, you know, like that, that story is way cooler um, and unique. Yeah, and then you could maintain like the super traditional aspect, and then I don't know. That's just my brain. <laughs> yeah, and I think about this too. Is like I also, um, those are more like we're talking about like having like this hierarchy of things, right? Yes. Um, because there's so much more work that I want to make. So at a certain point, like, um, I just won't be doing like character stuff. That mm -hmm. was that was more just like a fun right. side thing. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think about that all the time. Like, like because you you want like eventually your work to be like really, really integrated. And it's, that's what I'm trying to do with that torso. Actually, I'm trying to make it so that that piece will kind of stand alone on its own mm. as, as a thing. Like if you know the title, like if you, if you know the, the character name or the, the books, you'll know it, but it could just be like this Jack to do. Yeah, it could yeah. just be like this right. torso kind of classically cool. um, inspired sculpture. Mm -hmm. Um, which and it, that's like that's certainly no hate to anybody doing like special effects or whatever like that, that is a whole awesome type mm -hmm. of sculpting um it's just not what i want to do yeah um yeah that's interesting but i want to ask about like the new studio also because that's like really exciting and just epic and you know maintain your business but you think you're gonna do some more personal work and like yeah and that's like the main goal yeah the main goal is just to, to make more work mm -hmm. like i'm always thinking um that uh, I think he was 21, 22, Michelangelo, when he sculpted the Pieta. That gets in my head a lot. Now, granted, obviously, like, different times, like, there's there was no distractions or whatever back then. But yeah. I'm always thinking, like, man, uh, it is ultimately a short life we have. Mm. And so many sculptures I want to make. Um, what's that line from Willy Wonka? So much time, it's a little to do. Yeah. Strike that, reverse it. Um, mm. So little time, it's so much to do. So, yeah, the new studio is... Um, the goal is to make uh, more work, more mm -hmm. personal work there. Also, because it's just it's set up for it. it's a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, has light and tall ceilings. It's um, more professional, so I, I don't have to be bashful about asking a model to come totally. into like a creepy dark basement. Yeah. To pose. <laughs> this place looks a little more legit. So, yeah, yeah um, that's so exciting, dude. Yeah, and I think um, mostly going to try to do life size in there. Mm. Um, Maybe start like at a smaller scale, mm -hmm. work things out compositionally that way, but do three quarter or full life size. Wow. We'll see though. Cause yeah. you know, you do two of those and now you have no room. So it just depends. That's crazy. Yeah. And like, do you give yourself time deadlines? I know like things happen. You also have a business to run and that's a lot of work, but like in, in sculpture, are there like generic time, you know, like f for, I don't know. I don't know how to ask if you know what I'm saying. I think, yeah. Like I a mean, year you're saying you've been working on this one thing a year, but it maybe it's very often. Well, long. it's, it's been, yeah, it's been an existence for over that long. <laughs> I still haven't been working on it for a year. Yeah, yeah. It's probably only like okay, two right, months, right. If, a month of that in the actual clay modeling time. Um, I don't like to give myself deadlines. Yeah, okay. um, I like, I really wit like um, my most successful in a way sculpture to date um, is uh, my final project I did Prometheus the, the rebellious Prometheus so crazy Thank I want to see it in person so bad um, where is it it parts of it are in my studio it exists in like a bunch of different okay forms. maybe you showed me I remember yeah but, um, but wait, wait wait so what do you mean like y you took it apart when it was done so no when um, when that sculpture was finished I made a mold and then uh, my friend Thor Larson shout out Thor uh, is a sculptor in Florence, and he let me store the mold in his studio while I moved back to New York and figured things out. Um, and then the mold was too was going to be too expensive to ship back here. Plus, there's also in that piece, even though I'm very very proud of it, there's a few like caveats. There's a few like Damn. student hand really? things, unresolved no things. No one would ever know. Um, 
that I'm going to fix mm. and maybe re-sculpt it. Um, just like, you know, with that, there was like, that was like 10 weeks or whatever the project. So, you, you know, I didn't finish hands the way I should have. Right. 10 weeks is not that long. I'm assuming for yeah. something that big and detailed. Well, and that insane. was my fault. That that project was supposed to be just a, a, a seated male torso. And I decided okay. to do the whole figure. Yeah, the whole so that's figure. Me. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like cross-legged sitting down, something yeah. like that. I was looking up before. Um, but uh, so then I had my friend Octavio cast the fragments like in resin. Mm -hmm. And those were shipped to me. I put those together. And that's kind of what's in the studio. I see. Um, but I, I typically, if I could sculpt that to that level fast, I would do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, I'm a little bit slower. Um, part of that, I like, part of that is frustrating cause it's like, I could just make more work if I was quicker. Right. Um, but part of it, I really enjoy because it, when you give yourself that time, you give yourself time to talk yourself out of bad ideas mm. or just let maybe let different ideas come and go. I think that could go both ways though. Yeah. You, you fester on idea too much when maybe you certainly, get a, yeah, it's, there's, but, uh, you know, in, in school, it's like you, you move on from a project when you really can't get anything more out of mm. it, right? When there's nothing more useful to learn. And I think part of that is when you're professional um, making work, it's like knowing when it's done mm -hmm. and knowing when you've gotten everything you can out of it mm. and you learn from it and then you can apply those principles or something completely new in the next project. So typically um, I would, if I'm going to do like, a, let's say I'll just do a like life-size figure and I'm sculpting regularly, like, at least three to four sessions a week. Ideally, that's done in like three months. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, and that that might sound crazy long to some people. I know, like some sculptors I know are very fast. I don't know if it sounds um, long or not. But for me, I I like that kind of pace. Um, but so time, you need time. You need so much time. That's so crazy. The whole Michelangelo thing at twenty one. Yeah, I mean that's kind of scary. I almost don't believe that. Is that fair to say? Like, it's ridiculous. It sounds <laughs> insane. Yeah. But also, yeah, different time, different mastery. That's actually something I've written down. I have a question about, like, do you think people are, like, is there any innovations within the sculpture world that it's happening? Like, that, that there are people are pushing the boundaries. And I only say that because I know, again, that argument of, like, looking back into history at the masters and the amazing things they made. And I'm sure there's huge, large scale projects going on now. Maybe, yeah. like the biggest bronze pour mm -hmm. ever. I don't know how big that would be, but like, is there anything going on like that that you know where people, your friends are like open-ended question? Well, because yeah, it I've, just seems like back then, Michelangelo, all those things, like that was the kind of peak. And I, a lot of people say that about painting. Like there's not as many, you, we won't be able to be painting as well as they used to do, but I don't know. I'm just curious what you think of the sculpture. Role. Yeah. I don't know about innovation. Um, because when I think about that, that that just makes me think of the digital stuff. Like that's okay. like for better or worse, that is true innovate. That is something new. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, but in the traditional sense. In the traditional perhaps. sense, it's so hard because there's so much baggage, mm -hmm. like historical baggage. Like even that Prometheus sculpture, which I'm very proud of, and nobody thought about. Like it was me and two other guys. We chose this pose. But you can find I don't know at least minimum a dozen sculptures in that same pose mm. from history, just by definition of like. Now, sheer luck and yeah, the just, of you know things that have been made. Um, so, and now part of that is is kind of cool. Um, there's this idea that um, what's it called? I think it's called the Lindy effect. It's this idea that, um, that if something has been in existence for five years, it stands to reason it'll be in existence for another five years. Mm. Um, so it's it's like great inspiration to see that um, you know the David has stood for however many years, mm. five hundred years. Stands reasons can be around for another 500 years. Yeah. So when making your own work, and I think about this actually with my, not to deviate, but with my Red Rising piece, because it's bronze, as long as it doesn't get melted down, it could literally be around to exist in a world that's similar to how the one, like the science fiction one that Pierce Brown has Whoa, created. That is cool. So like totally. time certainly involved in it. Um, back sick. to the innovation in it. Because um, so many sculptors are pulling from the past too yeah that's um, another thing like by and like honestly doing it they're not like mm. it's not some sort of fraud they're not trying to pull one over on you it's just like you you know if mm -hmm. you're inspired by, by michelangelo you're that's going to show up in your work um innovation it's hard i don't or just like who's doing it like 
I don't want to sound so dumb and simple, like the biggest or the best. There are, are cool people projects who are going just on. pushing the boundaries. There are cool projects going on right now. There's um, a World War One memorial being made in, just across the river in New Jersey mm. um, that I believe will be the longest, if not if not the longest, close to the longest um, relief sculpture sort of relief. It's like really, really high relief, but also some figures in the round Whoa. made in the U S it's, I think it's about 60 feet long. Jeez. Um, Sabin Howard is making this, um, big, I think there's at least 16 figures. I'm not sure. It's probably even bigger Damn. Um, than what I'm describing it as, but so there's certainly ambitious projects yeah. in the works. Um, I wonder, yeah, it's just, I wonder what could be done so much of it is in the culture too like who's who wants sculpture right now yeah like it's it's been um divorced from architecture mm. which makes sense to me like i don't think i i would not say that sculpture needs to be on the side of buildings now mm. as it is in like a cathedral or something like that doesn't okay, make I sense yeah. the buildings we're making now i think sculpture plays an important role uh -huh. maybe on the interior um but i don't you know so that's fascinating because before that that's why sculptures were made for the most part they were they were paired to adorn, with to adorn tomb structure. to adorn structure cemetery wow. you know, whatever it is so we don't have that, that now uh, or we have much less of it so now it's like are you you know who's buying your sculpture mm. what is it for so mm. i th yeah i think um there needs to be like a, a big cultural shift to call on artists to to flex and bring their stuff before we see any any real innovation because um i think like how you and ken were talking like there's a serious lack of pursuit of beauty here mm. and does that perhaps lead into like your desire to teach also because you can kind of inflict your opinion on how things may not like an inflict is so harsh yeah i was about to say <laughs> not maliciously or of yeah, course yeah, but no, you know I like can. you want to be you know a light and i think people should have opinions this goes back to ken and his super passion like like you want to be able to mold students like yeah. you're not some evil person and well all, all their opinions are allowed but to have this sort of guiding light of hey this is something that we're working for yeah. and this is i'm going to help you get there sort for of sure because um even though and this kind of i guess contradicts that inflict bit, i shouldn't have said it's, that. it's hard for me like i do believe that there is such thing as a objective both truth and beauty mm -hmm. sometimes in a sort of contradiction it's hard to define that because it can be subjective but at the same time not really mm -hmm. like um if you were to just take people off the street and walk them in front of the Pieta, mm. walk them in front of a Bernini, a Rembrandt, whatever, or walk them in front of a Paul McCarthy sculpture or Urs Fisher, or Jeff Koons, whatever. Yeah. Everybody knows the wing of victory is, you know, so people pass in front of the wing of victory and they just like stop, right? Like pe people know there's a fundamental difference between these two things. Yeah. And that's in all forms of art, like Beethoven, like and Beethoven versus, you know, WAP, right? Like one of those, <laughs> Yeah. You can like both. Of you can course, have that hierarchy, yeah. absolutely. And even, I mean, in my own work, those ears are not strictly speaking beautiful, mm. right? But like, um, there's precedent in that. Like, you look at Rembrandt, like mm. painting like a meat carcass, right? Like, yeah. so there's a for things you want to explore. There's a huge hierarchy of values that you can have for what you want to. But for teaching, go back to teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Like trying to pass that knowledge on mm -hmm. um, while sharpening your own skills and re kind of always challenging your own beliefs too if you're trying mm. to you know teach that to a student and then maybe they have ideas that yeah like, some sort of discourse yeah yeah so absolutely I, I can't wait to start that but part of like i take that real that, that role really seriously mm. so part of me great power comes great responsibility yeah, exactly and how i was kind of joking about how like sometimes i think i'm like a fraud sculpture yeah. right now because i'm doing so much with the business i almost want to like i want to go study do like a two-week tune-up workshop with mm. my mentor or somebody um, just get back into that mindset of almost less about make like certainly making, but also just even just listening to the totally. the way the concepts are, are yeah. gotten across before I can start teaching it. But uh, what about taking a class at like uh, the Grand Central Atelier? Yeah, yeah, like for sure. Didn't, don't you know some of the instructors? I are do. Also the girl. Yeah. What's her name again? Uh, Heather Person. Heather. Yeah. Shout out Heather. She's she. They are. A fi I don't know if they've announced it on the website, but it's official. Like there's a sculpture program there now, which it's is not epic. It's not just. Um, uh workshops uh yeah it's a full-time sculpture thing so um certainly I mean, model time is what i like definitely need to get back to be able to teach um at yeah. least to the figure i could teach like if anybody wanted to come to the studio and learn how to sculpt from the cast mm -hmm. I, i'm pretty confident doing that mm -hmm. now 
um, for beginners, but for working with a model, I'd want to do it a few more times before yeah. jumping into it. Um, cause, uh, yeah, that's so important just to, to do a good yeah. job there. Cause one, I don't want to like, I'm talking, I don't want to see bad sculpture in the world. Right. <laughs> so I don't want to have a hand in that. Yeah. If somebody leaves, if somebody leaves my studio, not being able to, you know, have like their center line on the back and the front of the torso line up. Like that's on me. I guess you're right. If they're, and then their you're pelvis, feel guilty. Their pelvis doesn't sit right. Yeah. That's on me. So did you see that sculpture of Ronaldo? I know. I don't know if you like, I did see that. And like, that was that would be a funny a thing point. to react to, like a viral video as like a traditional professional sculptor. Yeah. But the world kind of that was a bummer. I don't know what happened. There. I feel like I could have done better. Yeah. And I've like never sculpted. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Maybe <there>. not. <laughs> yeah. And that guy's like I don't know if you saw the video, it was like dying. The guy like it was like the most two years of extreme depression, like everyone like death threats. It's like, whoa, that's a bummer. it was pretty bad. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's one thing too, when making, um, not, so I'm not talking about that sculpture. Cause that was, I'm sorry, objectively a bad sculpture, but I think when thinking way. about work you make and then putting it out there for public consumption, um, you really ultimately, like, even if you have a patron, whoever the work needs to be for you, mm. like you need to, because, uh, people are going to come at it from different ways and, uh, and almost it do, almost doesn't matter. Like I can count on one hand, the amount of people whose advice or criticism solicited or otherwise I would accept most people or, I don't yeah. care what they say right. about the good work. or bad, good or bad. It doesn't matter. Like good. Thank you. Thing. Bad. That's great. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, cause well, for a lot of reasons for one, yeah. it's, it's, it's that person that, um, uh, you know, isn't focusing on the same things that I am. They're mm. just looking at, you know, Greek penises and be like, oh, why is this? Yeah. Um, so I l don't care anymore what they have to say. Uh, others, it's just like, because with criticism, art criticism, I think it's valid when it's coming from someone that wants your, that has a vested interest in your career and your work. So like a teacher, mm. right? Like, because criticism is rough in ateliers. Yeah, you have thick skin. Uh, rough. But it's universally coming from a place of, I want you to be better. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, beyond that, um, in the world, it's almost all useless. Like, and, and in fact, the reverse would be even like better. Like I know I would be doing something well if I get like panned by like Jerry salts. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if that happened, I'd be like, I just made a, yeah. a very good sculpture. If he's shitting yeah. on it, you know what I mean? Right. Like, um, so <laughs> there's a certain amount of input, obviously maybe yeah. your patron has because, but even then like, ideally your patrons come into you because they see your work and they see something in it mm -hmm. and they're like, just do, do that. Make the, make the work that you know how to make. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's going to be fine. Um, yeah, that's, that's something. And I also, I'm a fan of, maybe we talked about this before. Like I like artists obviously for their work. That's probably the majority percentage, but I also like sort of like the person behind that. And like it, it, it may be, affects the work you know after i know someone and then they start making things and i i don't think that's necessarily important that's just for me because like for you like would you if you were you know like if you were unanimous you know would the work be the same for all the people looking at it or like most i'm sure a lot of people don't know you but even for me like i, I just always wonder like people's like people's opinion of my work if i didn't like vlog and be a social media oh, whore would their opinion on the work be the same or is it they know me in the background my personality is sort of injected in the viewing experience yeah it's just an interesting conversation yeah and sometimes i mean it also depends on like the amount of time that's passed because like mm. um you know, like Caravaggio literally murdered a guy. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, so, a lot of them, like, you know, diddled kids. Like, sure. Picasso yeah, was a yeah. scumbag. Yeah, like, yeah. all these Absolutely. things. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think... Great art should be great art. I think, yes, that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you can... You should strive to be authentic and honest. Um, if that means having parts of yourself that... Um, even though you know to be true or, or good that some other people wouldn't like, mm -hmm. it's like, I mean, you could, you could fake that and, and try to get more, um, more accolades. But then it's like, um, and then these are more talked about in that book too. Like, like one of the characters, that's all he does. It, um, 
uh, it's this idea of being a second hander, mm. right? Of of really um, doing things for other people and not yourself, like for the benefit of like other like you you make the work, like the sculpture that you make or the painting you make, whatever. Its sole purpose is to be like shown on Instagram for people right. to just just like that thing, yeah. Um, rather than have anything to say about you or what you believe, um, you definitely want to avoid that. Um, yeah. It, even though that you know it comes with the cost of maybe not being uh, immediately successful, mm-hmm. right? Because um, there's, I mean, you can figure out lots of ways to to certainly make money. Like just just look at like anybody that had a bead on rip betty white you know just make a betty white sculpture yeah and have it people, betty white fan art and get a bunch of views no offense to people doing this but like anybody that kind of was like oh the queen died yeah. let me make this portrait of a queen that's people's whole business you know okay yeah. sure there, and there's probably really really good reasons to do that yeah um or some reasons good reasons to do that but yeah. uh i question it sometimes too yeah um so I, I, yeah, I think that's why the work has to be, has to be front, like come from within you, uh, for, first and foremost, mm-hmm. um, which, uh, can be hard, particularly in a culture where like doing things for yourself is, uh, viewed as bad. Yeah. Um, like, uh, you know, I, the thing, one of the things I love about my business the most is that it, it literally does help a lot of people get these things. Yes. Um, but if you were to ask me why'd you make the biz- start the business, I'd be like, to make money. Yes, like of course. Uh, uh, these are the things that I wanted to do. Yeah, um, and it, it's frustrating when like something is bad when you're the beneficiary mm. of value, and it's only good when others are. Yeah, when it's like the exact opposite in reality. Totally. Like, um, so, especially when uh, the the way the real way outside of, outside of like some sort of coercion for something else the real way somebody makes money is by helping other people yeah you know i mean, mean that's like the dream but again it's not always that and to back, like i do that i make like it's like it's like a split you know it's again i always think of a pie chart because there's so many different design like agendas within making something like i make art for me by me don't care same with you good or bad I mean, of course you want people to like it, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's for me, but then I'm going to recycle that interest and that desire with my finished product. I'm going to recycle into like some poppy social media video to help and grow my business. You know what I mean? So like there's all these strings attached. It's not as black as white. Um, um, And now I don't know what I'm even saying, but I think, you know, it it is a pie chart, but also you're, I think, you know, again, like one of the issues I did have I'm with you. I kind of shit on normal art school. One of the issues I did have with the Atelier world was like, it's a lot of like uh, elitism and traditionalists, you know, almost yeah. to the nth degree where it's like, you have to do it this way, my way or the highway. There's a little bit of that. And it's like, okay, I get that. And yeah. if you want to learn, that's the place to learn by far, undoubtedly. But, you know, there's some, there's a lot of that where I'm like, all right, like, and so for you, you, I'm not saying that at all for you. I'm just saying you still are in this traditional world, right? Like that's your upbringing, your mentors. And so I think that's important to hang on to, yeah. especially as you start a business to make money. Well, the thing too, that I really grateful for the sculpture program there, the way it was designed, it was, it was, uh, very, it was much less that kind of like pinky up, mm. hoity toity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're using the wrong type of like that's a champagne glass. You know, you need a yeah, oh God, um, a flute. Be- because of the way Rob made the program, it was much more um, familial. People, there was healthy competition, mm. um, but it was more laid back, more room for people to be kind of individuals about how mm-hmm. they wanted to make the work. Um, so I think that sets people up when they leave. So no, that's like, great to ha- be less uptight about. Um, having to be like this really polished yeah thing you know yeah. what i mean this this entity that's like um i i uh, i'm gonna have this show that's gonna be like black tie and all yeah that, exactly you know, you know what I mean? exactly like, and like um, i feel bad because some people go through that program or those things and that's that's the only way they think they can make money and that's the right. only thing they want because that's the what they've been fed and it's like dude like oh my gosh there's so many ways to make money again like we were starting off like especially if you go through that and put in time 
you should have the door open for any way to make money. And that's why I get bummed out sometimes. This is my little insecurity is it's like people think I'm just like a YouTuber or like a sure. social media person. Again, flamboyantly just talking to the camera like an idiot sometimes. But, you know, I want to be taken seriously as an artist. And so there's that give and take. Yeah. But like, you know, like it's still a great way to make money and I could still take art seriously yeah. with all the things I learned from the atelier world. Well, but that comes through through your videos and, and your content that it's it's not an act, mm. right? Like mm. I think ultimately um, when people are like investing in artists, they're investing in some level of um, honesty yeah. and just like and they, they can see that out. passion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like that's the thing. Patrons aren't dumb or like yeah. viewers even on YouTube, you know, it's like. Don't count them out. Or at least the ones that you want. Right? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah. um, yeah, I would, like I said, I would just much, I, I've been in situations where, um, like in like these sculpture competitions, right. Where it's, oh, really? it's like 10 of us, we do a, we sculpt a portrait in four hours. Oh, um, is that in school or that's just, no, it's, it's been also the, um, national sculpture society puts it on. That's pretty I cool. I just did one in June. No um, shit. yeah. And, um, though that's interesting because, I don't sculpt fast. Uh, certainly not do a portrait, like a good four portrait in four hours, hours five hours. My God. Um, but you get people that come up to you um, and they just, it's hard, but they just get it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like any, anybody that um, collects your work in such a way, you can just tell when they're, like I was saying before, like any anything that you, um, you're, you, it's like that you have this yes too, mm -hmm. um, and you can really understand that from them when they come up to you and talk about your work to you, and and you can tell that they're tapping into something that you you're putting into it, right? Um, and that's really rewarding. Yeah, and I think that's um, that's that's the goal, and I think uh, above making money, but that achieving that will yeah. bring with it success. I think I, I totally agree. Yeah, if you're connecting with someone on that, you know, eventually. You're gonna have a bunch of people connecting, or one of those people of the bunch is gonna, yeah. you know, fiscally support you, financially support you. Well, I could talk about this forever, man, but this has been great. I think we gotta cap Absolutely, it off. Yeah. Two hours. Really? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Who knows what all? I mean, maybe uh, there's gonna be some edits, but I mean, this is yeah, just joyous and wonderful. So thanks for coming by, Absolutely. and everyone's gotta go check out Fountainhead Gypsoteca. Follow Justin, and that's a separate Insta Instagram account. It will all be linked. Yeah. Yeah. We'll link it up, and then hopefully also there's a video coming out. Him in his studio. I'm hopefully be sketching these. Maybe even someday in the future, if you're ever at your studio, I can come check it out also. The new one? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Once I get built out a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. Absolutely. And if you need any tools, yeah, I got a nice collection. Sounds good. But yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.